clock out at the Isaac Walton uh, Preserve in uh, Somerset. It's actually, it's Address the Fountain, but it's actually in Somerset. That's where it's actually at. I mean, it's just right there. Uh, but that's uh, maps inside the bulletin. That'll show you how to get there. Uh, I'm going to tell you the Harvest Carnival. We're going to have to delay the Harvest Carnival until probably February. I think we're just going to make it into a winter carnival. Uh, part of the reason is Kim was kind of overseeing the Harvest Carnival and was going to put everything together, and she's not going to be able to do that. I can just tell you that right now. So um, we're not going to be able to get that done in time. We're just behind schedule anyway with everything that's been going on. And uh, so we're just going to push it back till February, and we'll put it together a little bit better by then. Um, that's all the announcements I have, I think. So let's go ahead and get started tonight. We're going to continue uh, looking at um, 1 Corinthians. So we're going to finish up chapter 1. We're up to verse 29. That's where we left off. And then we'll work our way on down uh, into chapter 2 and hopefully get all the way through chapter 2. I need to get all the way through chapter 2 because I did this morning and I hate to get you guys on different uh, tracks because it's very confusing to me. So you're just going to have to stay till we get done with chapter two tonight. Uh, yeah, so this morning I was done a little early, so I think we'll be fine. Uh, verse 29, taking up where Jesus is talking about the fact that, or actually Paul is writing, well, Jesus is the one inspiring, you know, the Holy Spirit's inspiring him, God's inspiring him to write, uh, talking about the fact that none of us have any reason to boast about our salvation because God is the one who saves us. And that's verse 29 then, so that no man may boast before God. It's a reminder to the Corinthian Christians that they did not save themselves. They were saved by God through the message of the gospel, which they did believe and respond to, but God did all the work. God's the one who called them. Uh, it was God's son that died on the cross for their sins, making salvation available. And it's God who does the work in their life of calling them. And then they respond to the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. And he talks about the fact earlier, as we looked at last week, that not many people who are wise, at least in their own eyes, not many people who are strong in their own eyes, respond to the gospel in a positive way. Uh, and then we told you to read the story in Luke chapter 14, verses 16 through 24, where Jesus talks about um, the issue of the invitation, and that that is aimed at the Jewish people. So I'm going to read that today, because one of the things that's going on in Corinth is Paul is, is really pointing out uh, some issues with their view of salvation. He's issuing, uh, he's dealing with issues of how they view themselves and how they've divided up into groups. And he's just reminding them that they're all one in Christ and that each one of them who is saved has been saved by the same Savior. They've each one been saved by the same message. Uh, and this, this little story in the Gospel of Luke that Jesus told is a great reminder that not all who are called respond to the calling. And that's something that Paul is going to deal with as he works his way through this letter to the church at Corinth. Uh, so Jesus tells a story, and it's a story about a man who's having a big dinner, and that's where he starts. But he said to him, a man was giving a big dinner, and he invited many, and at the dinner hour he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, come, for everything is ready now. So we know that in advance, in the story, a man had prepared a large dinner. In advance of that, he had sent out a certain number of invitations. Now, the people that were invited in this first group are representative of the Jewish people. That's what Jesus is telling this story about. They had been invited through the Old Testament, prophetic word about Jesus that they were raised with, so they should have recognized their Messiah. And when their Messiah came and said, come, they should have come because they'd already been invited through the word. Uh, but they didn't. And so he moves on to the next part of his story. And he says, but they all alike began to make excuses. So in this story, this man has made this dinner that he's already invited these people to. So they already knew the dinner was coming. They probably knew when it was coming. And his servants now went out to tell them, it's prepared. You need to come and eat. Uh, so they all began to make excuses. The first one said to him, I have bought a piece of land and I need to go out and look at it. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm going to try them out. Please consider me excused. Another one said, I have married a wife, and for that reason, I cannot come. And the slave came back and reported this to his master. Now, what's fascinating about this, this story, and the reason I always apply it to 1 Corinthians, is he's talking about the fact that not many wise, not many noble, not many strong are saved. It's usually the broken, the weak, and the needy. People who recognize their need for forgiveness, their need for a Savior. Those are the people who hear the gospel message of Jesus, and they respond to it because it speaks to their heart. 
uh, and they recognize their need. And in their brokenness, they come to him and they find not only forgiveness for their sins, but also a transformation for their lives, a meaning and a purpose. And they find that in Jesus. And I look at this story and I'm always reminded the people who don't come all have one thing in common. They don't need to come in their own eyes. They think they've already got something better on their own. And that's why I go back to 1 Corinthians. And one of the things he's reminding the Corinthians of, you remember what your life was like before you came to Jesus. You came to Jesus because you were broken, because your life was a mess, because you were sinners and you had made terrible choices in your life that carried horrible consequences with them. And so therefore you recognized your need for Jesus and you came to him with your need and you found answers and hope and life in Christ. Well, all these people, they don't think they have any reason to come to the dinner. They've got their oxen, they've got their fields, they've got their new wife. They don't need to come. And so he says, well, when they won't come, I'm going to send the invitation out even further. And so he sends the, inv he sends the invitation out. So the head of the household became angry and said to his slave, go out at once into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in here the poor and crippled and blind and lame. Uh, and so they do. They go out and they find people in the streets of the city and they just begin to compel them to come in. And those people, as they're described in that particular part of the passage, these are people who have great needs. They're going to love a free meal. And so they want to come. And so they come. Uh, and he says, Master, what you commanded has been done. And still there is room. Even with all these people, there's still room for more. And the master said to the slave, go out into the highways and along the hedges and compel them to come in. So now go out into the rural areas, follow the same roads on out of town and begin to compel people that you find out in those areas to come as well, that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste of my dinner. And so then he makes the point, it's a very strong point, that there are a lot of people called, uh, but very few people actually respond to the message. And those who are called that do not respond to the message will not be a part of the kingdom of God. And that's what Jesus was trying to get across to the Jewish people. Now, when you take that and you look at 1 Corinthians and what he's saying to the Corinthian church, he's reminding them that God called them and they responded to the call. But they were not supposed to stop. They were supposed to go out and call others. And they hadn't been doing that. There's a lot of things the Corinthians stopped doing. They stopped being uh, driven by the word of God. They stopped carrying forth the gospel message. They compromised in many areas. And there's a lot of issues going on there at this moment in time. Uh, in verse 30, then going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, by, by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Again, reminding them that salvation is from God. It is his calling, his plan, his gospel. Christ is our wisdom. He is our righteousness, our sanctification, and our redemption. Now, those three things I'm not going to elaborate on right now because they're going to pop up again in chapter 2. At least part of them are, and the rest are going to pop up later on. Uh, but just keep those in mind because that's something that should be true of every believer, that our wisdom is in God and that he is the one who not only provides us our wisdom, but also our righteousness, which is foreign to us. It is the righteousness of Christ applied to our lives, our sanctification, which God is the one working in us to transform us, and our redemption. He is the one who paid the price for our sins. And so verse 31 then, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts boast in the Lord, so should you and I. As the Corinthian Christians should have been boasting in the Lord who saved their soul and calling all of those in the streets of the city to come to Jesus as well, and then to go outside of the city and compel all the people they met on the highways and byways to come to the Lord also, while they boasted and bragged about the Savior who had redeemed them and transformed their lives. And so Paul is reminding them is that they should, rather than arguing and using the names of Paul and Apollos and Peter and even Jesus as a point from which to argue, they should have been out in the city, out in the countryside, proclaiming the joy of having found forgiveness for their sins in Jesus Christ. That's what Paul is telling them they should be doing. That's not what they're doing. And that is a big part of their problem. And so we get into verses 1 through 5, and he's going to begin to unpack some more of what's going on, but he's going to start out by elaborating more on what he meant in verse 17 of chapter 1, when he makes the point that he really didn't come with a priority to baptize. He came with a priority to preach the gospel and lead people to forgiveness of sin in Christ. So he's going to elaborate on that, beginning in verse 1 of chapter 2. And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom. And so he begins to talk in verse 1 of chapter 2 
about his approach to sharing the gospel. And one of the things he makes clear up front is Paul was very well educated, but he didn't use that education to impress people. He didn't use a lot of the big words that he knew. Uh, I'm pretty sure Paul knew a lot of big words and he knew how to use them correctly, but he didn't use them. He said, I didn't come with superiority of speech. Paul could have probably out-talked anyone in Corinth, but he didn't try because it wasn't his purpose. And when he was talking to the people in the street, he talked like people in the street. If he was talking to people in the synagogue, he would talk like people in the synagogue because he was able to do that, but he didn't try to impress anyone by overshadowing them with his ability to speak or the knowledge that he had or the wisdom that he had. And he's very well educated. So he said, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom. In other words, I'm not worried about impressing you with my wisdom. I'm not worried about impressing you with my speech. In fact, if I do that, it tends to get in the way of what I'm trying to accomplish because you're going to be focused on me when I really want you to be focused on someone else. So he says, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. And what he means by the testimony of God is the gospel. So he said, that was my goal. As he said in chapter 1, verse 17, my goal was always to proclaim the gospel. And I didn't want to get in the way of that by trying to be too impressive or too flamboyant or too over the top. I just wanted to put it in simple terms so that everyone could understand and what I really wanted them to focus on was not me, but Jesus. And so I came for that purpose. And this is how I tried to accomplish it. I never tried to impress people with my use of language or with the wisdom that I had. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So he said, that's what I wanted you to know. That's what I wanted you to understand. That's what I wanted you to see. I wanted you to know who Jesus was, and I wanted you to understand what he did on your behalf. He says, in fact, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. So Paul reminds them that when he was with them, he never pretended to be anything that he wasn't. He was very transparent about his own shortcomings. He was a man like them. He had fears. Uh, there were things that made him tremble. Uh, and he had weaknesses. And he never tried to hide them. He was upfront and honest about it. Again, he did not want them to worship him. He did not want them to revere him. He wanted them to recognize that he was a sinner like them, but that he was a sinner saved by grace and that he was a person in the process of being transformed by the power of God. Because what part of what he wanted them to see, well, let's read the rest of it and we'll talk about what he wanted them to see. So he wanted them to know who he was, but he also wanted them to see the power of God at work in his life. And that's how they would see the power of God because he would be doing things that he himself could not do in himself or by himself. So he says, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. So again, you see his motives, you see his direction, his clear priority, and you see a lot of his method here. So he's basically saying, I was very transparent about who I am. I'm a man just like you. Uh, I have many weaknesses. I have fears. I tremble at times. Uh, but I am filled with the Spirit of God. I have the power of God at work in my life, and that's what I want you to see. And he said, I wanted you to hear that then in my message and in my preaching. So I didn't go into a lot of persuasive words of wisdom, at least not from a worldly perspective, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. So he didn't try to force people into the kingdom of God. He proclaimed the gospel in a clear, understandable way, and then he left it up to people to respond to that message. Now, I think that's an important passage that we should really take to heart. Are there times when we're sharing the gospel that we would just like to drop kick people into the kingdom? Maybe drop kick's not the right term. Push? You ever want to push somebody? I have a few times. Glenda, I know you know I have a few times. You're thinking of one person that I'd like to push a couple times, you know. I mean, he's right there, you know, and I'm sharing the gospel. And I'm like, Go on over. <laughs> You'd like to, but you can't. And, and you don't want to pull one of those tricks where you try to get people to say something they don't really mean or try to trick somebody into doing it. I, I never want to be guilty of doing that. So you always have to stop at some point and leave it up to the individual to make that decision. And that's what Paul said I was doing. He said, I never tried to pull tricks on you. I never tried to use word games to get you to do something you didn't want to do or didn't mean. 
Uh, it doesn't mean anything if you get people to raise their hand when they don't really mean it or you get them to repeat something that they don't really mean. So it's not about that. It's about sharing the gospel and then leaving it up to people as the Spirit of God convicts their heart to respond. Even though I know in our well-meaningness, we'd like to see people make the right decision. Uh, so it's, it's something that we just have to let God work and let people decide. And so he said, that's what I did. I never tried to trick you. I never tried to argue you in. I tried to answer questions, I'm sure. Uh, I always preached the gospel and raised Christ up. And that was in demonstration of the spirit and of power because the gospel is the power of God for the salvation of lost souls. That's the power he's referring to. And it is the spirit of God who convicts and calls people. So he says, when I preached, it was a demonstration of the spirit and of power so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men. See, here's the thing. When you preach the gospel and you trust in the Holy Spirit to convict people who are hearing the gospel, that is God, all. All of that is God. It's his message. It's his spirit that's doing the convicting. And when people respond to that, they're responding to the right one. You don't want people's faith to be in you. You don't. You don't want people to trust in you. You want people to trust in Jesus. You want people's faith to be in Christ, not in you. And so he said, I didn't want you even to rest your faith in my wisdom, the wisdom of men, but in the wisdom of God. So that's why it's not up to us to change the gospel. We don't get to water it down. We don't get to add to it because when we do, it becomes the wisdom of men. So when we take sin out of the gospel equation, it's not the gospel anymore. It's just the wisdom of men. When we take the call out of the gospel, it's not the gospel anymore. It's just the wisdom of men. We have to present the gospel in its entirety and let the power of the Holy Spirit convict and draw people so that they turn from their sins and find forgiveness. And we can't use persuasive words or manipulative words to force people into doing something that we want them to do. It's not the way this works. And Paul reminds them of this. He said, this is what I did when I was in your midst. I didn't do anything fancy, nothing tricky. I just preached to you the gospel message and I did it in the power of the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit moved in your hearts and minds. And you responded. You responded. You answered the call that God put on you to repent and come to him by faith. So moving on to verse six then, he says, yet we do speak wisdom among those who are mature. So he makes a distinction here. Notice that his first goal was to spread the gospel and to see people come to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, to find forgiveness for their sins. Second thing he did, though, was he didn't leave people there. He took people who had responded to the gospel, and he began to teach them the wisdom of God from the Word of God. He began to go into deeper things. Paul describes this, the gospel as milk, uh, and some of the basic elements of the Bible as milk, easy to digest things. Other things he describes as meat, things that are more difficult to understand. And we're going to talk in a minute about the difference and the difficulty people have in understanding the Word of God. But he says, we moved on from that, and we did start to speak wisdom, but it was a biblical wisdom. Uh, but we did that with those who were ready for it, those who were born again and had the Spirit of God in them. He said, a wisdom, however, uh, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God predestined before the ages to our glory. So he's talking about the Word of God, specifically the Old Testament at this point in time is what he was teaching. And he was showing them Christ in the Old Testament, showing the messianic passages, showing the parts about the prediction of the crucifixion and what Jesus was coming to accomplish, that he was coming not to set Israel free from the Romans, but to set the people free from their sins. And so he was going through and explaining all of that and going deep into these Old Testament passages and opening their eyes to the wisdom of God. And not just about Jesus, but also about things such as morality. He was showing them what was right and wrong, what they should and shouldn't do. And he was just unpacking all of that. And a lot of that got really deep really quick. And he was reminding them of many of the things that Jesus taught about these passages as well. So he is diving into some deeper territory and teaching them the things they need to understand, things that had been revealed by God through the ages uh, in the Old Testament. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. And then he elaborates on that a little bit. And he says that the rulers of this age were not able to understand this. There was a something that hindered them from being able to understand these Old Testament passages. The rulers of this age didn't understand. 
And it was clear that they didn't understand, for if they had understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But just as it is written, things which eye has not seen and ear has not heard, and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. So he said all of these things were there for them as well, but they didn't understand them, and we know they didn't understand them because if they had, they wouldn't have crucified Jesus. Now he's going to dive into why didn't they understand? So why didn't the Hebrew people understand the Old Testament scriptures? Why didn't they recognize Jesus when he came? Well, he's going to get into that. And he's going to use that as, I believe, what he, where he's going. And as I read Corinthians as a whole, what he does, he talks about Israel's rejection of the Messiah and Israel's lack of understanding of scripture as a lesson. And then he talks to them about their lack of faithfulness to their Savior and their lack of understanding of Scripture. And he begins to explain why people don't understand Scripture. And there's a lot of points in this that are really good theological points that you and I need to understand today, because I think sometimes we expect lost people to understand the Bible. And I want to bust your bubble on that one. They can't. And I'm going to show you biblically why they can't, okay? Uh, we're going to do it right now. I'm going to show you exactly why they can't understand the Bible. And it's always a sure sign that a person is not regenerate when they can't understand even the basic things of Scripture, okay? So we'll show you those things from the Word of God tonight, beginning here in verse 10. For to us, God revealed them through the Spirit. So the Hebrew religious leaders didn't get it. They didn't understand it at all. But he says, we do. Even the Gentile converts in Corinth are capable of understanding what the Old Testament said about Jesus. For God revealed them through the Spirit. So he starts out right off the bat at the beginning of verse 10. He explains why they're able to understand these things that even people raised with them were unable to. It's because they have the Spirit of God in them, and the Holy Spirit in them was opening their understanding, their minds and their hearts to what the Word of God said. So that they could understand that Isaiah 53 was a passage written to predict the suffering, not predict, but to foreordain or foreshadow or prophesy the suffering of Jesus. So when you read Isaiah 53 as a believer, tell me with the spirit in you that you don't read that and understand that that's talking about Jesus dying on the cross. You do, don't you? Do you know that the Jewish people of Jesus' day who were raised with Isaiah 53 never connected that to Jesus? Never. Only, the only Jewish people of Jesus' day who connected Isaiah 53 to Jesus was that little group of disciples that had surrounded him during his earthly ministry. And when he died on the cross, they made the connection. And some of them struggled to make the connection early on until he helped them, but they were the only ones that did. And so what he's telling us here is that the Spirit of God in us takes the Word of God and brings it alive. We understand it. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. So he reminds us that the Holy Spirit in us searches all things, even the deep things of God, because he is God. The Holy Spirit is God. And so he understands the depth of God, and he's going to explain to us. Again, this is a great Trinitarian passage too, by the way. Uh, For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Who understands your thoughts other than you and God? No one. Uh, I know people that have been married a long time think they understand each other's thoughts. They don't. If they did, they'd be divorced. The reason they've been able to stay married a long time is because they don't know all of each other's thoughts, right? Trust me, everybody who's married has at one time or another thought something bad about their spouse that they've never expressed for good reason. (laughs) So we don't know each other's thoughts. Nobody knows your thoughts but you. We may know some of your thoughts because you tell us, but even then we're just taking your word for it, right? How do we know you're telling us the truth? And and most people don't tell the truth about what they think. Some people do. Um, Some people wear it like a badge of honor while they rip you to shreds. I'm just, I always tell the truth. (laughs) You know. (laughs) Then they verbally assault you. Um, But most people don't tell you everything that runs through their head. They they have common sense, and they don't say everything they think. I definitely don't say everything I think because a lot of what I think is foolish and dangerous. And so I don't say everything I think for that very reason. So again, only you know all the thoughts in your head. Nobody else does. And that's the analogy he's going to use because everybody's going to understand that. Everybody knows we don't say every foolish thing that pops into our head. We really don't want people to know everything that we think about anything. 
because a lot of our thoughts are evil and wicked, and we really don't want to expose those to the light of day. And so only we know our actual thoughts, the way we actually think about different things and situations and people. Uh, he said, that's true. And everybody knows it's true. No one knows the thoughts of a person except for the spirit of that person, that person themselves. He says, even so, the thoughts of God, no one knows except the spirit of God. So the next thing he then takes that analogy and he draws the point that no one knows the thoughts of God except God. Now that's just kind of makes sense, doesn't it? No one knows the thoughts of God but God. Isn't that awesome? Makes perfect sense to me though. Makes perfect sense to you too, doesn't it? That only God would know his own thoughts. So tell me, how are you going to understand the thoughts of God without God's help? You're not. And that's what he's going to tell us in the next few verses. Verse 12, now we have received not the spirit of the world. So we don't have the spirit of the world. That's not what we received from God, but the spirit who is from God, which is his spirit, the Holy Spirit. And that's what we're indwelt with. So that we may know the things freely given to us by God. Now, in 1 Corinthians 2.12, he tells you the primary purpose of God giving you the Holy Spirit. The primary reason God gave you the Holy Spirit was to seal you and to then teach you what the Word of God meant. You want to know what those freely given things are? Those freely given things are your Bible. The revelation of God. Uh, all those words in that book are freely given to us by God. They are his revelation to us. It reveals himself. It reveals our nature and who we are. It reveals our need, his solution to our need, the gospel. Uh, it reveals to us the end of time as God is going to bring it to a conclusion. It reveals to us the beginning as God brought it into existence. The Bible contains everything that we really need to know, the essence of life the purpose of life, the meaning of life, the beginning and the end of life, all of those things, who God is, what he's like, all those things are in the Bible freely given to us by God. The problem is they are the thoughts of God in written form and only the spirit of God is capable of understanding the thoughts of God. You see why lost people can't understand the Bible? Now they can garner some facts, they can memorize some verses, they can talk about Bible stories but to really understand what it all means, not going to happen. They can't. They're not capable. So when we talk to lost people, one of the biggest things we need to learn is we need to have a lot of grace, and we need to show a lot of mercy, and we need to have understanding that they really are incapable of understanding what we're trying to get them to understand. They really don't get it. And so the need they have is not for us to browbeat them with our Bibles. The need they have is for Jesus. They need to find forgiveness for their sins in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then God will put his spirit in them, and then they need to be taught what the word of God teaches, and then they'll be able to understand it because the spirit of God in them will help them to understand it. And he's actually going to get into how this works, which I think is fantastic. But going back just real quick to the gospel of John, Jesus talked about the coming of the Holy Spirit, and he was talking specifically to that inner circle, those 11 that would be left after Judas, and I think eventually Paul who would be added in by the call of Christ on the road to Damascus. I'm still sticking with my idea that Paul's the 12th apostle who replaced Judas. I'm just, I can't give it up. I'm sorry. Um, I need to argue that someday uh, somewhere, like a college or a seminary. Troy, give me an invitation so I can argue that Paul's the 12th apostle, you know. I just want somebody to torpedo my idea, but I think I'm right. Um, and I'm going to stick with it until somebody proves me wrong. Just like I don't believe James, the brother of Jesus, wrote the book of James. I think James the apostle did. But anyway, whole other story. Yeah, you're going you're gonna to argue with me. We're going to have to have lunch so you, we can debate that issue. Ooh, that's an interesting one, isn't it? All right, John 14, 26. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. So in John 14, 26, Jesus was telling them about when he's gone, after he's crucified, and after he dies, he wasn't going to leave them alone. He was going to send someone to help them. And the helper is going to be the Holy Spirit. And notice how he identifies what the work of the Holy Spirit is going to be amongst the apostles. He is going to teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. So two things. One, and I think they're actually in reverse order of how they would function, but he's going to do both things for the apostles. He's, number one, going to help them to remember everything that Jesus taught them while he was here. And Jesus taught them a lot. Uh, it was like drinking off a fire hose. Without some help, they're not going to remember everything Jesus said to them. Uh, and so they're going to need some help with that. And the second thing was, he's, they're going to have to help understanding. Because even when Jesus was teaching them, how many things did Jesus teach over and over again because they didn't understand it? 
I mean, how many times did he talk about his death and they still didn't get it that he was going to die for the sins of humanity? I mean, so they're going to need some help. Uh, and he's going to send the Spirit back to do that. Now, for us, I think what Corinthians brings out is we don't have remembrance of things that Jesus spoke directly to us while he was here on earth physically. But what we will have as we read the Bible is a remembrance of things we've read, the words of Christ that we've taken in. We have a tendency to forget those. So the Spirit is in us to help us remember those things, to bring them back to mind when we need them. And he's also there to do the same thing he was doing for the apostles, and that's to help us understand it. So the Spirit helps us remember the words that God has shared with us in his word, and the Spirit helps us to understand them, just as Jesus said the Spirit was going to do when he came. So moving on then to verse 13, uh, going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So we understand the work of the Spirit is to help believers understand the word of God, the revelation of God, the things freely given to us by God. So verse 13 then, which things we also speak. Uh, so let me back up to verse 12 and, because it's a long sentence and I'll just skip through it fast. I want to read the whole thing. So this is a very long sentence. So verse 12 begins, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. Now, verse 13 is very helpful in understanding how the Holy Spirit works in the heart and mind of a believer. So, uh, when he's talking about spiritual things, he's talking about really spiritual things. We live in an age, it cracks me up, that people claim to be very spiritual. Uh, the only way that you can be spiritual is if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, as, and Lord, and the Holy Spirit is dwelling in you, and then when you have a conversation with the Holy Spirit, you're actually having a conversation with the Holy Spirit. And that then makes that spiritual. Uh, if you're not in conversation with the Holy Spirit, if you're not going back and forth with the Spirit that's in you, you know what you're doing? You're talking to yourself. And there's nothing spiritual about talking to yourself. It's not. There's nothing spiritual at all. So all you're doing is talking to yourself. To be spiritual, you have to be spirit-filled. Then you can be what we would call spiritual, where you're communing with someone else. You're communing with the Spirit of God, but you can't be spiritual if you're just talking to yourself. And if you're talking to demons, I'm not sure that qualifies as spiritual either, but that'd be your only other option. It's kind of scary, right? Another spirit. So I don't think you want to go down that road either. Um, so he's talking about spiritual things. And he uses two terms at the end, spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. All right, see so with me. That means these are God-given so that it's a conversation that makes it spiritual between God and man, between the soul of man and the heart of God. So we also speak not in words taught by human wisdom. So he's discounting human wisdom as being irrelevant, not important, not a priority. So we don't speak in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit. So when you and I are talking to people, we need to be talking from the perspective of the wisdom of God, not from the perspective of the wisdom of the world. So he says, this is what we should be doing. This is how we should speak. It's how we should think. It's how we should live. But then he talks about a, a, what I call sort of a process, if you want to know how it works, I guess. How does this function? Uh, those taught by the Spirit. So he's teaching us that the words that we're going to learn to use are taught to us by the Spirit. Combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. Now, what would be the spiritual words that we would read or hear? The Word of God. The words spoken by God through inspired writers. So the Bible is, we do believe, right, that the Bible is the Word of God. That would make the words of the Bible spiritual words. In other words, we are having a conversation by reading. We're hearing from a, a higher being, God. So that would make those words spiritual. So how does the Holy Spirit then produce spiritual thoughts in us? How does he combine those spiritual words into thoughts and make them into spiritual thoughts? Well, uh, you take the words, you read them, and then he helps you understand them as God intended for you to understand them. He helps you to know what God is actually saying to you. And that then produces spiritual thoughts. You with me? So a lost person reads the Bible, and they can understand people and places and stories. They can understand dates and times and how many people died in this battle and who fought in that battle. 
And they can understand that a person ate a fruit off that he shouldn't have ate when they read Genesis. They can understand Revelations where everything is blown up and rebuilt. They can understand all of that. What they can't understand are the truly spiritual parts where God is revealing himself to us, where God is explaining who he is and what he's like, where God is talking about our need and his solution, and he's talking about how we should live, and he's talking about moral things such as right and wrong. They're not going to understand that. Not at the level that you're going to be able to understand that because the spirit in you is going to take those words and apply them to your mind so that they truly become spiritual thoughts. They are thoughts, in other words, that have a spiritual nature to them because they're developed through your communion with God. And that's really awesome. Verse 14, but a natural man does not accept the things of the spirit of God. So here's the problem then. So the natural man the unsaved man, the person still lost in his sins, he does not have the Spirit of God in him. And so when he reads the Bible, it's a bunch of gibberish by and large, especially when it comes to the actual meanings of the Scripture. And so he reads it, and then as he reads it, because he doesn't fully understand it, they are foolishness to him. So he just thinks it's foolish then. When it talks about things like trusting in God and depending on the strength of God, not your own, that my power is made perfect in weakness. He reads that and he thinks, that's the most foolish thing I've ever heard. When Jesus talks about laying his life down for many because he loves us, because God is showing us grace, he's like, what? That just doesn't make any sense. And so they'll read all these things that mean so much to us and to them are just foolish because he doesn't get the deeper meaning. He doesn't understand the nature of God. That's spiritually discerned. It comes from communion with God as you read the word. And that's something that he doesn't have. He doesn't have communion with God. And so he's not able to understand the word of God at that level. And so everything in the word of God just comes across as foolish. And he cannot understand them. And then he finishes it with these words because they are spiritually appraised or they are spiritually investigated. The word appraised comes from the Greek word that can also be translated investigated or examined. So these things are investigated and examined spiritually, not investigated and examined carnally. You can't just investigate the Word of God through the flesh by reading the words off the page. If you do that, they're just words off the page. Um, They have to be spiritually discerned as the Spirit of God, and you takes those words off the page and quickens your heart and mind in response to the Word. So that's how the Spirit of God works. That's how He opens our hearts and our minds to the truth of the Word, helps us to understand it, and then it becomes a part of our lives. And that's what he does. But the lost can't do that. And so when it comes to issues of morality, one of the things I think that frustrates Christians is when we talk to people about what is right and wrong, and they cannot understand what is wrong, or they completely flip it upside down, and they call what we would call wrong right, and they take what we would call right, and they call it wrong. And we get frustrated with them because we can't understand why in the world they would do that. For example, for years, I used to get really hung up on how people could have a... um, pro-choice sticker on their car and a save the whales sticker on the car at the same time. I just couldn't understand that. It just didn't make any sense to me. You're not worried about babies, but you're worried about whales? Doesn't that seem wrong? To me, it seems extremely wrong. But to them, it seemed perfectly normal. And I came to understand this passage, that they're incapable of understanding the things that I understand. They're incapable of seeing things the way I see them because they're not filled with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, these words of God just seem foolish to them. So I understood then for the very first time that when I was talking to them, they actually thought I was foolish because they were incapable of understanding the points I was making. Right? Because I was trying to make the point that human life is sacred because we are made in the image of God, which they don't understand what that means. I'm afraid a lot of Christians don't really understand what that means either. Uh, but that's why human life is sacred, and whales really aren't. I think we should be good stewards of what God has put us in charge of. I really do. Uh, But at the end of the day, when a whale dies, it dies. When a person dies, the soul goes to eternity. There's a huge difference there between those two. Uh, And if you can't understand that difference, it's because, again, you don't have the Spirit, so you don't understand the idea presented in Scripture, a spiritual word, You don't have the spiritual idea or the spiritual thought that human life is special and unique because we're creating the image of God. You don't understand what that means and all that entails. So again, it just comes back to this. You have to understand that the people you're talking to are not going to understand things 
that you understand. They're not going to see things the way you see them because the Spirit of God is in them. Even if you quote chapter and verse at them, they're not going to understand the chapter and verse you quote because they can't. And you can't really blame them because they can't. No matter how hard they might try, they might love you a lot and they might really try to see things your way, but they can't. And you know who said they can't? God. God said they just can't. Their sinfulness gets in the way. It blocks their vision and their understanding. It has an effect on them that they cannot overcome on their own. That's why you and I need to be set free from our sins in order to follow Jesus. We are enslaved to them. It controls us. Uh, Verse 15 and 16. But he who is spiritual appraises all. Fascinating truth. To be spiritual, you again, I'm not making this up. I get this as I read the whole chapter. To be spiritual, you have to be spirit-filled. You have to have the Holy Spirit. Then you're a spiritual person. At that point, because you can read the Scripture and understand it because of the work of the Holy Spirit in your heart and mind, you can now appraise all things, which means you can look at all things and make correct decisions about them. So you can look at situations, circumstances, things that people do, and you can determine whether or not they're right or wrong because you have a standard by which to determine things that was given to you by God. And because of the Holy Spirit in you, if you read it and meditate on it, let the Holy Spirit work in you, you will have an understanding of what that is. Those spiritual words will become spiritual thoughts, and you'll then be able to look at things and spiritually appraise things. Now, whether or not you take advantage of that is one of the big issues, isn't it? Because a lot of times we don't want to use that ability that God puts in us because we want to do what we want to do. That's one of the struggles we still have. But the Spirit's at work, and that's what the Spirit does. That's His primary focus in our life, by the way. Once we're born again, is to teach us the Word of God, to help us to understand the things that God has freely given us. Uh, And then he talks about, yet He Himself is appraised by no one, which means that we don't need others to judge us because God's going to already. Uh, But the bigger part of that is that next part. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? So the next part that he talks about in this, and this is where he's angling as he gets into dealing with the error in the Corinthian church, because the Corinthian church is filled with sin. Uh, It has a lot of error in it, and he has to clean it up. And God has inspired him to write this letter to clean it up. God wants it cleaned up. He wants some of the things that are going on to be stopped, and he wants them to be stopped right away. And so he starts out by this particular viewpoint. He says, for who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? So who knows the mind of the Lord? Who can instruct God? Who knows more than he does? And the answer, of course, is no one. No one can instruct God in anything because God knows all things. And people know very little about any topic that you might mention. And they think they know everything, but they don't. And they know very little. But God knows all. So nobody is going to be able to teach God anything. No one's going to be able to give God instructions because no one is capable or qualified to do so. He says then at the end, and this is uh, the last words of this chapter to the Corinthian believers, but we have the mind of Christ. Now going back to, yet he himself is appraised by no one. If you're a spiritual person, which means you have the Holy Spirit in you, you actually read the Bible, The Spirit takes the Bible and applies it to you and helps you to understand it. And you have the mind of Christ. Who should instruct you? Who? God, Christ. That's who should instruct you, right? Should the world be giving you instructions? No. Uh, There's a fascinating thing here that's going on in Corinth. Rather than listening to God and following the direction of Christ, even though they were in the process of being sanctified and growing in the mind of Christ, where they would think like Jesus, that's what it literally means. Because if you look at Romans 12 too, Paul talks about this same topic, and he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. Uh, so he says, don't be like the world. That's what conform means. Don't think like the world. Don't act like the world. Don't talk like the world. Be transformed. And how are you transformed? By the renewing of your mind. What do you think renewing of the mind is? The work of the Holy Spirit in you 
helping you to understand the Word of God so that you can accurately apply it to your life. That's the renewing of your mind that he's talking about here. And that's what transforms you from being worldly-minded to being spiritually-minded, to being a spiritual person. So that you may prove, and it's so funny to me too, for years I was raised thinking that spiritual people were the people who got in church on Sunday and raised their hands and sung real loud. Weren't you? That's not what being spiritual means. What being spiritual means is being in tune with the Holy Spirit and understanding the Word of God and accurately applying the Word of God to your life and living it out every day. Because that's what it means to be in communion with God. Jesus didn't say for no reason, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. He meant that. The way in which this relationship works is you love me as I love you. I love, and Jesus loves us so much he laid his life down for us. And we should reciprocate that by loving him so much that we willingly and joyfully obey his commandments. And that's how it works. Spiritual people know the commandments of God. They know what is morally right and what is morally wrong. They embrace that and they strive to put to death the old man and live out the life that Christ has called them to. That's a spiritual person. Now, that may result in somebody singing really loud and raising their hand, but that's not what it means to be spiritual. That may be an element of being spiritual. But you can also do that and not be spiritual. You can do that and just want everybody to see you. So there's a lot of reasons why you can do that. Those are different things. Uh, So he's looking at the renewing of the mind so that you may prove, why do we do this? So that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So that by doing this, you're proving what the will of God is to yourself and others, by the way, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So that's how he does with Romans 12 too. But then going back to the idea at the end of verse 16, we have the mind of Christ and who is going to instruct him and then who should instruct us? Well, if we have the mind of Christ, nobody, the world certainly should not be instructing us. And this is the sad state of affairs. Many Christians now are getting more of their moral instruction from the world than they are from God. So we know what God says. The Spirit in us helps us to understand what God means by what he says. So those spiritual words become spiritual thoughts in our mind. And then we say, this is what is right. And the world says, oh, no, that's not right. That's wrong. You can't say that. That's that's evil. And we then take marching orders from the world on morality, and we alter what the Bible teaches. We alter our own view of right and wrong. We alter, we alter our own view of morality, what is good and what is bad. Uh, and that's what happened in Corinth. They started listening to the Corinthians rather than to Christ, and they knew because they were spirit-filled, they were true believers, and they had the mind of Christ to a certain level. They're, we're all still in the growth process of that, but we, they were into that process. And they had a good understanding of some of the things Paul's going to address, and they knew what the Bible taught, and they understood it as to what was right and wrong, such as the man marrying his mother. They knew that was wrong and should not be accepted. They didn't have any doubt about that, but in Corinth, it was okay, and so they got pushed back from the people, and they basically were cowed into saying, well, you can't really object to that because, you know, we don't think that's a bad thing. And so they actually changed their view of morality in that instance and allowed it, not only allowed it, but then celebrated their tolerance in allowing it. We don't see any parallels there, do we? I mean, I could draw like 15 parallels to the church today because we got more than that going on, Um, but there's no need because everybody's aware of them. And again, A lot of that comes back to the church did not want to instruct the world on morals and instead took its instruction from the world on morals. I'm of the mindset, and this is my mindset, I'll just be honest with you, I am not going to take moral instruction, moral instruction from the world. I'm not. I don't need corporations to tell me what is morally right and wrong, especially when corporations take advantage of workers all over the world. Uh, I don't need them to tell me what's right and wrong. That should just be a common sense thing. We should know that by now. Uh, They can put whatever they want in their commercials. I'm not listening. Uh, And you shouldn't either. I'm not going to take moral direction from morally inferior people. I'm not going to take moral direction from politicians on either side of the aisle because they're all a bunch of liars. I don't need people who pander for office and tell people what they want to hear to get a vote to give me moral instructions. I don't need that. I don't need the world to instruct me on right and wrong. I don't need people who are lost to tell me about morals. Uh, I don't need them to try to tell me what is right when they have no idea what is right. I'm going to take my instructions from God. God's going to show me what is right and wrong, and I'm going to listen to that, and I'm going to build my life on that. And if you don't like it, that, well, I don't know what to tell you. 
Because here's the problem. We're supposed to be instructing the world on right and wrong. The world's not supposed to be instructing us. Because the gospel begins with, you're lost. Always. That's where the gospel always begins. You're lost. And guess what you're lost in? You're lost in your sins. And what defines a sin? What God says is right and what God says is wrong. So if the world decides what's right and wrong, there is no sin anymore. The world's going to flip the script every time because they cannot understand God's moral standards. They don't understand why God says the things that he says. And don't be shocked when the world says, well, God's just hateful and mean. They don't understand why he does what he does because they don't understand who he is. And their fallback option is, well, he's cruel and mean. That's their fallback. That's the only thing they have because they don't understand. So we need to understand that. Again, you have to have grace and mercy, but don't let people teach you morals. Don't let people instruct you in right and wrong when they don't know what right and wrong is. You have the mind of Christ if you're reading your Bible and you're filled with the Spirit, and the Spirit is taking that word and helping you to develop spiritual thoughts from spiritual words, and that's what the Spirit does. And if that's the case, take your instruction from Him and only from Him. And then instruct somebody else. It never hurts to show people what God says, and so that they will recognize their sin, and then the Spirit of God will convict them and draw them that they might come to him by faith and find forgiveness for their sins. And so that's what the Corinthian church, that's where the breakdown started. That's where it started, and then it just snowballed from there. And so he starts there. He deals with the division. He tells them to stop using his name and the other guy's names to justify their divisive stances, and then he launches into the issue of how they should be functioning as individual believers because they're not functioning that way as individual believers. They're also not functioning that way as a church when they gather together as a group. And then he'll begin to unpack how that's affected the church as a whole because of their lack of commitment to Christ and their lack of understanding of who is the instructor and the teacher and who they are to follow. And that's what he'll deal with then. And and then he'll give them directions on how to actually follow Jesus and deal with those issues. All right, so we'll close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for another day that you bless us with. Thank you for the word you've given us. Uh, We're thankful as always for your spirit that you put in us that helps us to understand the word, helps us to take that word and apply it to our lives. And we just pray you continue to do so. We pray that you would give us wisdom and understanding, uh, that your spirit would work in us as we read the word, uh, that you would just uh, bring it to life in our hearts and our minds so that we can truly understand it the way it's meant to be understood and that we can apply it correctly. And help us not to take instruction from the world on morality, but help us to look to you for instructions on morality, that we would turn to your word always and seek what you say about what is right and what is wrong and what we should and shouldn't do. And then help us to build our lives around that understanding. Help us to truly have the mind of Christ, that we would think the way you would have us to think, that we would then act the way you would have us to act. So, Father, we pray for the transformation of minds and the renewal of minds, and just the transformation of our lives to continue. And we thank you for the promise that you will finish that work one day. It's where we find our hope. It's where we find our peace. And we praise you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.